Matthew chapter 19, if you would please, in your New Testament. We'll pick up of our first by verse study of Matthew's gospel, the good news according to Matthew <clears throat> about Jesus the Christ. I think what we've been noticing as we've been going through here that Jesus is now in earnest preparing his apostles to take over in the building of his church after he ascends. Now, he's already told them that, that he's going to depart, but they haven't fully grasped it yet. They are so personally, intimately involved with Jesus as their rabbi, their teacher, their friend, they're beginning to become more and more aware he is Messiah, predicted in the Old Testament to establish the kingdom of God, the church. And so the Lord is now intensifying his training. This is on-the-job training at its finest. So as each one of these questions come up, like we see in chapter 19, let's start there. Verse 1, now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And a great multitude followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? testing him. Now, he was up north in Galilee. This is a 60-mile hike on foot with his apostles at his side, and the Pharisees now have, from Jerusalem, because he's closer there, have crossed the Jordan River to the other side to test him. Now, on the bad side, Jesus saw through that they were refusing to accept him as Messiah, and so they're going to prove that he isn't with these questions. On the good side, a part of their duty was to test anyone that the people thought might be the Messiah and put him to the test. But Jesus is seen right through to their heart. And he's using these occasions to train his apostles to do the same thing, to answer difficult questions, trick questions, questions designed to test your faith. Sound familiar? This is why the study of the Gospel of Matthew and the others is so critical to today. More and more people are challenging not just the federal government, but everything. The young generation coming up are challenging everything. And so they may or may not, but probably will at some time come to you and put forth a difficult question. Now, it may be to test you or it may be sincere. What I want you to do is be able to answer it regardless, to give a reason for the hope that is in you, says the Bible. So now we get Jesus using these occasions to prepare. Now this is the first question. The second one is in verse 16, if you'll look there in your Bible. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? An excellent question asked to the right person. He's talking to the Son of God. What good thing should I do to inherit eternal life? We're going to get to that question and how Jesus is going to use this question to better train his apostles after he is gone. And you, as this question is, comes to you, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We're going to look at his 
answer and the response of his apostles. Each question is going to have a parable attached to it, and each question is going to raise questions by his, each answer is going to raise questions by his apostles, questions you may have already in your mind. So with that, let's get started. And he answered and said to them, verse 4, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Now, we could talk about that for an hour, couldn't we? <laughs> and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. That's the answer to the question. But let's read the question again because it is a slippery one. Verse 3. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? See, in their culture, it had become a practice that a man could set aside his wife, give her a writ of divorce, a single piece of paper that he filled out and signed and hand to his wife for any reason. She let the coffee boil over. Well, they didn't drink coffee. You pick a reason. So there's the trickery of the question. And notice how Jesus answers it. He uses the Bible. What does the scripture say? He goes back to God and he goes back to creation. He created them male and female. God established marriage between a man and a woman. And God said that what he puts together, let no man separate, which is in most wedding vows even today. But this raises a second question. Verse 7, and they said, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? So they're using the law of Moses to counter his statement. Now, it does not negate the first statement that Jesus made as an answer, but he, they're asking, could you elaborate? Could you explain yourself, Rabbi? He does, verse 8 and 9. And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Now, that's the answer of Jesus to the question, why did Moses give a certificate of divorce if God intended you to be married till death do us part? Now, we could talk longer on that from the writings of Paul, but Jesus isn't there yet. He's going to allow Paul to explain how that works in reality. So here we are, in this situation of on-the-job training with these apostles. And this raises a question from his disciples, verse 10. His disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, is it better not to marry? I can see some of you going, yep. Yep. If I have to be stuck with him for the rest of my life, maybe I should have stayed single. <laughs> maybe so. But Jesus is going to answer that question. He's going to use the opportunity of their third question to train them further and us, if you will listen. Here he goes, verse 11. All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it was given. That's key. Verse 12. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, 
and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. You follow his line of reasoning? There are certain people who either by birth or by the hand of a man cannot marry, cannot sustain a marriage. There are some who choose celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Those should not marry because they have made the choice to not marry, either by birth or by the hand of a man or self-imposed. If you can accept it, go for it. Very few people can. Only a handful of people down through the ages have been able to successfully dedicate their lives wholly and completely to celibacy for the sake of God's work. Only a few even in some groups where they pledge to do so, they cannot by their own human will sustain it. Why? Because God didn't give them that spirit to keep that promise, so they fail. Some try to hide their failures. Some simply give up and decide to marry. Some cannot maintain fidelity. Now know this, those of you who are my age and I'm looking around, which is most of us, can remember incidences where God exposed leaders in the church who could not be faithful to their vows. God had no problem shining the light of his glory on their sin and exposing it worldwide. Even those who now went on to their TV shows in tears and repentance and whatever usually ended up doing it again because it wasn't in their commitment to do what God established them to do. So God revealed it again and again. Footnote, if you're trying to hide something from God, now hear this. It will not embarrass God to embarrass us. It does not turn his cheeks red. We may blush, we may cry, hopefully we repent, but he will not tolerate it. And this is what he's preparing his apostles to deal with. For it will happen in their ministry, and especially in churches that the apostle Paul establishes. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 if you don't think so. So this is on-the-job training at its most defined completeness. Now, notice what Jesus takes the opportunity to do, and I'm going to suggest this is wise for the church today. Verse 13. Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. Remember last week? You need to have the humility of a child to enter into the kingdom of God. And he laid hands on them and departed from there. Here's where I think the lesson is. We as adults need to be very mindful, especially in these last days, what our children are hearing in our discussions. We need to be very careful of the innocent ears of children as we talk about whatever issue it is. On a parental level, may I suggest this. Good parenting means, and some of us learned this the hard way, that our kids never hear us fight if we have a disagreement, we do it out of their hearing. 
They need to know that they're safe and secure and that our discipline isn't based on anger or our upsetness with our spouse, but rather their need for discipline, not based on our emotions. But I think what Jesus is saying, don't forbid the children to come to me. Let them come. And we need to be mindful of what they hear us say when we think they're not listening. Now, those of us who are grandparents know they hear everything. And sending them down the hall to their room won't work. (laughs) They will have their ear to the door, if not right around the hallway. You know this, don't you? So we need to be consistent in our discipline and our love. They don't need to hear. I can remember one time, a couple of years ago, one of my granddaughters coming to me and saying, Grandpa, will I have time to finish high school? <laughs> because the discussions around the house and here was that Jesus is about to return. Every September, Bruce and I think, this is it. <laughs> we missed it again. we got to wait another year. We're convinced Jesus returned during the fall feast, which is in September. So Bruce and I have to go through another 12 months. <laughs> Unless Jesus decides to prove us wrong, brother, I'm out of here. Now, notice the next question that arises that Jesus uses, and he explains it perfectly. Here we go. Sixteenth verse. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what thing, excuse me, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. But if you want to enter into into life, keep the commandments. He starts correcting the young man from the beginning of his question. Why are you calling me good? May I suggest the reason he hadn't thought of the correct answer on his own, own from the Holy Scriptures was that he was confused about the holiness of who God really is. So he was ascribing a term that should have applied to God the Father only to this rabbi. So Jesus saw right through this young man. Why are you calling me good? You should be referring to God as good. So you're trying to get a double-edged innuendo in your question. I'm either the son of God or I'm just a teacher. You see the issue? So he nails him from the get-go. My suggestion is a lot of questions you'll get will be like this. There will be a subtle darkness under the question. I perceive that you are a righteous person, knowledgeable of the Bible. Therefore, I want to ask you and get your information, your wisdom on this question. Did you catch it? Of course you did. They're building you up to torpedo you. They're not going to accept your answer. And then they're going to challenge their description of you. Don't fall for that. Jesus didn't. Of course, he's a whole lot smarter than we are. Nonetheless, this is OJT at its finest. Now, notice his answer. Verse 18. And he said to him, which ones? In other words, the ruler... Luke calls him a ruler. Here's just a young man. The young man says, which one shall I keep? And Jesus starts listing them off. Thou shalt not 
See there, I memorized them in the King James. <laughs> you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, and you should not bear fault witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, All of these things I have kept from my youth. What do I lack? <laughs> Jesus looks right through to the heart of this young guy. I've done all that, so what am I missing? Hoping Jesus would say what? Nothing. You're in. And then Jesus pulls the carpet out from underneath him. Verse 21. If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Oops. And when the young man heard that, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Which one of the laws that Jesus listed had he not kept? He doesn't mention covetousness. That's what I've been told all these years, but Jesus didn't list that. May I suggest it's the last one that he says. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I'm going to suggest that's the one the young guy was falling short of because he's bragging on his riches. And Jesus is saying to him, he's challenging his agreement that he's kept this since a young guy. You really don't love your neighbor because your riches are more important than their need. Ouch. He walks away. I don't think the young guy was ready to give it all up for Jesus. We were talking about this very thing Thursday night. What does it mean to reach that point in our faith that we're willing to trust God completely? You catch the connotations and implications of that question? Where in our life, in our faith, do we need to come before we're willing to completely trust God? May I suggest that in our prayers, we're revealing to the Lord we really don't trust him as much as we say we do sitting in this room. Oh, we trust God explicitly. Do we? Lord, you need to do something with my kids. Amen. Amen. What could I say to them now that will turn them around? You just betrayed your prayer. Maybe I ought to send them to rehab again. You just betrayed your prayer. Maybe I need to spank them harder or spank them less. You just betrayed your prayer. You catch my line of thinking? If you're going to lay the spiritual welfare of your children and their eternal life at the mercy seat of the Lord, leave them there and quit trying to help God. Let me ask you this. Has any of the things you did in the past worked? Why is what you're going to do tomorrow work? This is what this rich young guy wasn't willing to do. He wasn't willing to trust the Lord with his entire life. He wanted to keep his riches and be known as a faithful follower of God. Which causes his disciples to ask a question. Verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, As surely I say to you, that is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I think this is the hyperbole. He has used them before in the previous chapter about gouging out eyes and cutting off hands and feet. I think Jesus is using an extreme statement, perhaps a cliche of their culture, that it is easier for a camel to go through, oh, that's too big, I can't even, I have a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom. Why? He wants to come out the other side with all of his wealth. Let's put it in spiritual terms. Some of us want to get into the kingdom of heaven and take our sins with us. Well, that's just the way I am. Really. Except for the grace of God. Really? See, we want to say to our friends and ourselves, even our face in the mirror, I am wholly given over to God. However, this one little thing I want to keep, whatever that little thing is. Paul deals with this very issue in Galatians chapter 3. This very thing of the ruler wanting to get life by keeping the commandments. Much of the book of Galatians is contrasting the law with grace. And in the third chapter of Galatians, Paul asks this question in verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Jesus is setting this very revelation of how grace works for Paul to expound upon with this conversation with the ruler and his apostles. If you're trying to enter heaven by keeping the law, it will not work. You will give up and go back and then say to others, I tried Christianity and it simply does not work. Why? You weren't converted. Too many churches, in my opinion, are trying to combine faith with work. They're trying to say you are saved by faith plus works. Some of them are so diabolical, they have made up rules and they say to their congregation, you're saved by Jesus and the keeping of our rules. They're trying to keep their thumb on you using fear to keep I shouldn't say you, some in line for fear if they step out of line, they're excommunicated from the church. Even to go as far as saying, if you are kicked out of here, you have no hope. Now you know of whom I'm speaking, don't you? There are churches exactly like that. There is no grace, there is no mercy in their preaching. What they're saying is, you're saved by grace through faith and dot, dot, dot. Some kind of rule keeping. And Jesus, through Paul, is saying to the church, not just to the church in Galatia, which by the way is a huge providence of many cities and to the church in Chino Valley. Are you foolish enough to think that having begun in the spirit, you can be justified by the flesh, the keeping of rules? And the whole chapter talks about this very thing. We 
are saved by grace. Period. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Period. There is no but or and or dot, dot, dot. By Jesus and him only. It is that simple and that difficult. You have to come to the mindset that the blood of Jesus has redeemed you from your sins. You're now set free from sin. Romans chapter 6. You're no longer a slave to sin. Romans chapter 6. You're not, sin shall not have dominion over. We just sang it. If you sang it, then believe it. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? You have been baptized in Jesus. Your old man has died. Your old woman has died. There is no other person in you. There are no two natures fighting to see who's going to have dominance. In you is one spiritual person. Born again, new creation. And as soon as you begin your mind around that, you say to yourself, oh, I get it now. I'm actually free in Christ. And the rest of us are going, duh, no, welcome to the family of God. Sometimes that awareness is so dramatic. I have known of people who thought, that's when they became born again. When they realized what happened at their birth, their spiritual, their second birth, later on in life, whether weeks or decades, they go, oh, now I'm born again. No, you were born again back then. Now you realize who you are in Christ. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's training these apostles to establish the church in truth, which causes Peter to ask a very good question. Back to the Bible, chapter 19, Matthew. When the disciples heard this, verse 25, they were astonished, greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked to them and said, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Don't misapply that verse. Jesus is talking to, to his uh, disciples about salvation. And that's all he's talking about is salvation. That's the context. With men, you cannot save yourself. With God, any person can be saved. I went a little too far. I got my little grandchild upset. <laughs> if that's you deep inside, go to the Lord. Amy doesn't have enough room to hold you all. But you see what I'm trying to say? God is saying to you, if you're holding back, if you're holding on to something, if you haven't released it yet, let it go. Just let it go. Because with God, it is possible to be saved and when you're saved by God you are saved yeah. then Peter said verse 27 see we have left all and followed you therefore what shall we have Poor Peter. And Nolan said, what do I get? I've been doing this a long time. Do I get that new truck this year? And Jesus said, no. Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory and you have followed me, will also sit on twelve thrones, 
judging the 12 tribes of Israel, period. He's talking to the 12 apostles, not you, not me. He's saying to them, because you have left everything to follow me, there is coming a day when you will sit on 12 thrones and you will judge all of Israel. Next verse. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. A hundredfold of what? Houses? Lands? No. Treasures in heaven. Lay up treasures in heaven. Just because you have given your life and your home to home fellowship, Bible studies, a house of prayer, whatever, doesn't mean you're going to get a hundred more houses. God is saying you're going to be rewarded for your faithfulness. I'm going to suggest that a hundredfold is beyond your imagination. Beyond what you think you might be able to receive, God is going to say, I own a thousand hills and all the cattle on them. What do you want? And we're going to say, I want life with you. You got it. Verse 30. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Oops. There it is. As children of the king, Jesus is asking all of us to be the last in this world and gain to be first in his kingdom. Be a servant of all. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. He made that lesson clear when he took a towel and a basin of water and he washed the feet of his apostles at the last supper and he said to them as I have done for you you do to others as students of scripture you know that he is not telling you to go get a basin of water and a towel and some soap and wash everybody's feet. What he's saying to you, serve. If their feet need to be washed, wash them. Literally or figuratively. If they need something you have, give it. I knew a man in San Jose who had done well, worked hard, and done very well. And around his neck was a gold chain and a gold nugget, fairly large gold nugget. And a lady of church came up to him one day and said, do you know how many people that would feed and this man pulled a wad of cash out of his pocket and said, tell me. You get the point? He was extremely generous. Extremely. She just didn't know it. And she thought he had to give up that. And he had so much. Tell me how much you need. I'll take care of it right now. Off she went. See, God knows your heart. And he's saying to you to say to others, how much do you need? Not cash. You. Now, as the team comes up and sings the closing song, before we dismiss, I want to keep the promise I made at the beginning. If anyone here would like to have the elders come and anoint with oil and pray, we would be pleased to do that, honored to do that. 
And since it's approaching 1030, if you have a child next door, you may want to go over and get that child and bring him back and relieve them to come so they can be a part of this. Amen?